do to a great extent with the fact that when you become a Christian, there's a difference in you and what you were when you were out in the world caring nothing about the Lord's will and doing it. Conversion begins in the heart with the reception of the Word of God, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And of course, when you look at the steps in the plan of God's, of God's plan of salvation, then following belief, one is commanded to repent, which means a complete breaking down of one's old stubborn will, which is the seat of all sin and rebellion against God. We describe it sometimes as an about face from the life we were living and going toward now with the resolve to serve Christ the rest of our lives. Having obeyed that commandment, we are now ready to confess our faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10 and verse 10. And thus we are qualified to complete our obedience to the gospel and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of our sins. Our Lord adds us to the church when we do that, Acts 2, 38, 41, 42, 47, Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21, Matthew 28, 18, verses following. And we are determined to fill our minds with His mind. We do that by the study of the Scriptures. And it is seen in the life that we live. So I want to speak with you today on the wrong kind of speech. Our speech is wrong when it's not according to what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 and verse 29. There the apostle pen, let no corrupt speech proceed out of your mouth, but such as is good for edifying, which means spiritually building up, as the need may be that it may give grace, that is favor, to them that hear. Now the Christian speech will not be corrupt. I have to learn what the Bible teaches to understand because it's the standard of authority. It's where the Lord's will is to know what is corrupt. If I do what the Bible says and speak as the Bible teaches me to speak, then I won't be involved in that which is corrupt, even in my words. It will be designed to edify, as I said, to build up. It will be in response to the needs, and underscore needs, of the hearer. And it will benefit the listener. Notice I say the one that listens. That is, the person who understands what you're saying and is interested in it with the intent to apply it. Our speech is the wrong kind of speech when it's not according to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. Well, you know, we're charged with being able to make a defense to everybody regarding what we believe and what we practice. This, in effect, is saying much the same thing. When we think of the wrong kinds of speech, I dare say many times we're thinking of curse words or filthy language. Well, of course that's wrong. But I dare say we're not aware of the fact that in our speech, that good speech is being able to answer people as you ought to answer every man. The Christian speech will always be designed to be a blessing to those who hear it. You know, every word the Lord said was designed to bless those that heard it. Even when He said, you generation of vipers. You know why that was good? Because that's what they needed to hear about themselves. When He said, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. That was good to those people concerning their anxious desires about the things of this life and how they would have it. That was good for them. And the Lord said it. It will always seek to save. It will always seek to preserve. It will be in response to the known needs of the hearer. And I mean spiritual needs. 
It will come from a heart, the inward man, that considers not only the what, but also the how. Our speech is the wrong kind when it is false. A rule of logic is that every precisely stated proposition is either true or false. I have found over the years in working out situations as to arriving at the truth on any point to use true-false statements to check my thinking. I think it important to know that it is possible for one in all honesty and sincerity to speak, to repeat, or to write that which is false. The Baptist preacher may, in all honesty and sincerity, preach the doctrine of salvation by faith only. But when he states that one can be saved without being baptized, he's making a false statement. And if some hearer repeats the statement, it is still a false statement. The New Testament teaches no such thing. And if 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people honestly believe the statement and sincerely repeat the statement, guess what? It is still false. Remember that false witnesses testified against the Lord. Matthew records such in Matthew 25, 59, and 60. Our speech is the wrong kind when it's a lie. In Colossians 3 and verse 9, the inspired apostle Paul says, Lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. In other words, you've been converted. You're not what you used to be. You don't even think that way. And if you're still thinking and living like you did before you became a Christian, guess what? You really didn't become a Christian. You weren't converted. You got wet, but you weren't converted. He goes ahead to say, and they put on the new man, have we? Which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. I know of no way to do that, to be dedicated, but to be dedicated to the right division and the study of the Scriptures and the honest application of the will of Christ to my thinking and my life. Now look with me as recorded in John 8 and verse 44. The Lord said, Ye are the lust, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Thus, we need to understand that the devil will tell enough truth to cause men to accept a lie. I think probably therein is one of the greatest things a person can learn is that the devil will tell enough truth to cause people to accept a lie. Now that puts a lot on you and me because it means we must closely examine the scriptures and we must closely examine the application of them to our thinking and life and our association one with another and the people in the world. When a man lies, he speaks not from himself, but he has allowed himself to become an agent of Satan. If I live the truth, speak the truth of the gospel, and defend it, whose agent am I? So when I go contrary to the teaching of the Bible, in whatever way that may be, then whose agent am I? What does the Bible say about liars? Well, in Revelation 21, verse 8, we read, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. You know, that takes in the white lie, doesn't it? That some people think you can get away with this as long as you tell a black lie. 
But he says all liars, so it gets white and black alike, and all gray in between. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 21, verse 8. Does that tell me that I should be cautious about what I say about this, that, or the other, or somebody? Look at Revelation 21 and verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it, speaking of heaven, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, then at the very close of inspiration of the last chapters, we have it in Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 15. The Bible's pretty plain, for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters. Now watch this last part. And whosoever, that's as broad as the human race, loveth and maketh a lie. Do you realize that it's possible for one to be honest and sincere and yet be involved in a lie? To think that what he's telling is true and yet to be speaking that which is false. That, I think, goes on quite often. And yet the Bible warns us against such things. If and when one does not have a genuine love for the truth, the Bible's clear in 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11. God will send a strong delusion. That they might believe a lie and be damned. A lot of people don't understand what that means. Folks, there's only one body of truth made up of all sorts of component parts that bear upon our going to heaven. If you don't love it and you turn from it, there's no place to turn to but error, for there's only one body of truth. If you leave the Bible, and specifically the New Testament, to find about salvation, then there's no place to go to but error. I know that a lot of folks talk about, well, there are many roads to heaven. No, they're just one straight and narrow way and it's straight and narrow because it's hemmed in on all sides by the authority of Jesus Christ who declared himself that I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the Father but by me John 14 and verse 6 so we need to understand the strong delusion is simply sent because we have will to turn away from the body of truth there's no other place to go for the truth except where the truth is. And that's in the scriptures. We quote this verse most often, but don't we realize what it's saying? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Now, if that's not saying the Bible's it when it comes to the standard of uh, right and wrong of going to heaven, then what else would he have to write to say it? And if you turn from the divine volume, saying, I'll go learn God's will, whoever that God may be, somewhere else, where are you going to go? You know, some people would say in our modernistic age that gets more many roads to heaven idea or many roads to somewhere running through them that, well, you're so narrow you could see through a keyhole with both eyes at the same time. Truth is narrow, folks. Nobody seems to understand that. Truth, the very nature of it, is narrow. And so is gospel truth. And God's located his power to save only in the gospel. Romans 1.16. That's the reason Paul wasn't ashamed of it. And there is no other way to heaven except through the gospel message. And the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. James 1 verse 25. 
basic notions in lying. Number one, falsehood. And number two, deception. We've talked about Abraham in class this morning, and frankly, I think he deceived by not telling the whole truth, so he didn't just explicitly, in so many words, tell a lie. But you think throughout the Bible, the serpent lied to Eve, Genesis 3, 4. The old prophet lied to the young prophet, 1 Kings 13, 18. Peter lied about the Lord, Matthew 26, verse 74. Ananias Sapphira lied by word and by action, Acts 5, 1 through 11. And you know, sometimes we fail to realize that the sin of omission can involve lying because you can lie by failing to keep the commandments of God. Do the work, do the work. We're servants of God. Let us follow the path that the Master has trod. And we'll sing songs like that, and we'll sing about how we're to be doing this and doing that, and we in song affirm that we love God so much, but in works do we deny it? Now what is that? So one can lie by failing to keep the commandments of God by claiming that he keeps them. The scripture says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments. Anybody familiar with that scripture? Is a liar. And the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 3 and 4. Oh, you remember that's written to Christians, folks. As most of the New Testament was. Also, one can lie by failing to keep his word with others. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Men are often careless about their promises. And it completely takes the power out of the word promise. If you're constantly making promises, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll do that, but you don't. What is a promise? It's no longer true, generally, that a man's word is as good as his bond. We need to understand also that our speech is wrong, it's not good, it's bad, when it's incomplete, when it's incomplete. It's right to tell a person that he must believe on the Lord in order to be saved, but it is not right to fail or to refuse to tell the person the rest of what God requires. Now that would work on a number of things. Do you remember our Lord doing so much teaching on the cost of discipleship? Getting people before they ever become his followers to realize this costs you something. Too many people today, and this is in general throughout the land, the churches and denominational Christianity is a come when you will, how you want to, and do as you please outfit. Never hold me accountable for anything. Don't ever correct me. Don't show me ought to do this or not do that. You can see such a turmoil so people won't be allowed to do anything. Don't tell me I have to do that. But God does. And Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same to judge him in the last day. This New Testament means what it means because it's the Lord's will. And it'll mean that on the day of judgment. To deliberately withhold pertinent information is to be dishonest. Ananias and Sapphira were liars and hypocrites when they withheld important information about the price of the land, Acts 5, 1 through 11. Also, speech is bad and when one repeats the words but not the meaning. Now, I'd like to explain that a little bit. When one repeats the words but not the meaning. It's very, very difficult and often impossible to tell what another person has said. Now, there are several reasons for that. You may be able to deliver the exact words, but you may not be able to deliver one, the smile, the twitch, or the whatever there is of a facial expression or the sound of a voice. You may not be able to do that at all. Now they said, 
the Lord of the Lord that destroy this temple and I'll build it in three days. Well, now the Lord said those words, didn't he? But the Lord did not mean what the accusers had in mind. And thus, when you are dealing with others, then you have to be particular about how you say what you say. Then, too, it's bad when it's the thing is true, the speech is bad when it's true, but the telling of it would do no one any good and possibly could cause lots of harm. Even, and hear me on this point, not that you shouldn't hear me, I hope on all points, but especially this one. Even in confession of one's sins before the congregation, it's often best not to be too specific. Before you tell it or repeat it, ask yourself, why am I telling this? Number two, why do I want to tell it? And number three, is my motive in harmony with the Lord's will in telling it? I knew of a situation that happened many, many years ago of a preacher who was quite well known in West Texas, in that whole region. And he committed a certain sin. And he was so remorseful, so ashamed, so repentant that he confessed the sin far beyond the knowledge of the sin. And that just simply shows a lack of understanding of the confession of one's sins and what the Bible actually teaches about. One should confess sins to those when it's people involved. Of course, all sins are against God and we're obeying His commandments to repent and confess them to God. But sins publicly known, we should realize that we don't want to create a view that's unnecessary there ought to be some thoughtfulness rather than just emotions governing what we do. Before telling anything, we should subject our thoughts then and our words to the following. Is it true? Do I have all the necessary information? Will it do any good? Will it or could it hurt someone? Or sometimes I'm afraid that's exactly what is intended. Will I want it to be told about me? Will the Lord tell it? Then speech is wrong and bad when it is blasphemous. To speak against that which is sacred and divine is to be guilty of blasphemy. The inspired James says, Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called, James 2, 7. So to criticize and to oppose God's plan and God's arrangements is blasphemy. To seek to destroy a man's character and influence is to blaspheme. James 4, 11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. Evil means something contrary to the truth about your brethren. And the record still teaches against an elder received not an accusation except at the mouth of two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5, 19. That's not in the Bible, folks, just to take up space. On the day of judgment, it'll be right beside Acts 2, 38 as to what people do and don't do. Then, speech is wrong when it's gossip. From the old country TV show, Hee Haw, part of that song is, we don't go around repeating gossip, so you would have to listen close the first time. Well, you know, that wouldn't be funny if it just wasn't the way people actually are. Some of the funniest things in the world are because they tell the truth about people. Gossip is groundless rumor. It is hearsay. It is idle talk. It is babbling. 
It is tail-bearing. It reflects on the attitude of the heart. It is telling regardless of whether or not what is told is true. The record says, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Sounds like America. Not, now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. That is a kind way of saying, mind your own business. 2 Thessalonians 3, 11 and 12. In 1 Timothy 5, 13, Paul discusses young widows. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house and Facebook. I didn't say that. And, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busy bodies. does sound like Facebook, doesn't it? Busy bodies. And many times speaking things which they ought not. Tattlers is the Greek flularos, which means to boil over. To bubble, to babble. Boiling, bubbling babblers, I like that. <laughs> but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody, as a meddler, in other men's matters. You know, that would be an impossible thing to keep yourself from if other men didn't have matters It's none of my business. And sometimes I think in our trying to check up, we deceive ourselves and say, well, I'm just trying to find out how godly they are. I'm just trying to learn about how faithful they are. And if we don't watch out, we're just trying to learn all their business. That's why soap operas are so popular throughout the day. Because <laughs> they're built on that idea. In other words, don't confuse nosiness with concern for souls. Brethren, let's be determined that we will avoid gossip. We will not engage in it. And we will not listen to it. But speech is bad when it's unjust criticism. Not all criticism is unjust. Nobody can grow and develop and be taught and instructed and learn without some just criticism. The home ought to be a place for just criticism. It's a place of molding and making and shaping and correction. There's definite value to constructive criticism. But we're thinking here about the kind of criticism which is always out of place. In other words, you can't do anything without being criticized for it. And about the only thing you could say some people do in their activities and they're very vigorous in it is they criticize. They know how to do that. Because see, you can, we can all criticize one another. You can do the best you can to obey God's will. Somebody can criticize you for it. Some people seem to find pleasure in criticizing others. They don't seem to be happy unless they can criticize or lambast some person or something. If you undertake some worthwhile project, you can be certain that they will be around to criticize you. They're not, they're not doing really anything themselves, but they're good critics. They don't have a better plan, but they don't like what you're doing. Or the way you're doing it. I wonder how many good works have been hindered or killed by such critics. Speech is not good and it's bad when it is involving false accusations. Again, it's a, it's a very serious, critical matter to bring an accusation against another. It's especially serious to bring an accusation against an elder, 1 Timothy 5, 19. The Old Testament record of Korah, Datham, and Abiram who accused Moses and Aaron of taking too much authority upon themselves ought to prove that, but it doesn't. Not because it doesn't prove it in itself, but you're talking about proving things to people. And Jesus proved himself to be the Son of God, the Savior of the world, but he didn't prove it to a lot of people. You must keep that in mind. The earth opened up and swallowed them and their associates. Number 16, Paul says you need to learn this. It'll help you in the church. Jesus endured many false accusations. They, uh, they said that he was a glutton. They said he was a wine bibber. They said all that kind of thing about him. They said he was a friend of devils that he was a blasphemer. 
They said he was a Samaritan. I've often wondered that wouldn't mean anything to us today, but that shows you how they looked at Samaritans in those days. Well, the accusations didn't prove the matter. People are full of accusations. But have you noticed in the secular world and this, that if you just make that accusation over and over and over again, in the minds of people, it must be true. Not there's been any proof offered. You just keep saying it. People accept it. This is the world in which we live. People don't ask for proof today if they even know what it is. They don't look for evidence. They look for what suits them and will condone them and guide them. Often the person sinned against by false accusation doesn't even know about it and has absolutely no way to defend himself. I got to people when that happens and they understand this is an accusation. You know, we ought to stand up for the other person. You think about it, the innocent unborn who are being murdered in the womb by the millions. They can't speak up for themselves. They can't defend themselves. We should. We should speak out all we can to point out it is nothing but absolute murder and speak up for those who can't speak up for themselves. And that works with brothers and sisters in Christ when there are false accusations made. And we know they're just accusations. Accusations to stand must be proven. Speech is not good when it brings up matters which have been repented of and which have been forgiven. It's possible for a child of God to go astray it happens. The Bible's full of it. Great and good men in the Bible that are listed there for the goodness they did and faithfulness they still, many of them, sinned. And to sin and to die unforgiven is to be lost. God's provided for the return of His children. There is a second law of pardon, and it's to the child of God. God's plan of restoration includes genuine humility when it comes to one recognizing as a child of God that one has sinned. Two, a confession of those sins. And three, genuine repentance. There's the rub. You know, you can come down to the front and you can say, I have sinned, and you'll be right. Whatever it is you've got in mind. But did you repent of it? Is the resolve there saying, this I will never do, and what I did was wrong, and I will never do it again, and I will do all I can? Well, you say, well, yeah, but you're human. You may sin again. Well, yes. But the resolve ought to be there every time one sin and all that repentance means that I will never do this thing again or if it's something, a sin of omission, that I will start doing what I've left undone. Then, of course, there's prayer or prayers for forgiveness. And if we're unwilling to be forgiving toward others and merciful as we want God to be for us, He's not going to forgive you. When repentance is evident and when correction has been made, notice, when correction has been made and when forgiveness has taken place, no one has any right to bring these matters again. If we have that right, God can. You want God to bring up everything you have committed that, that was sin? That you think He's forgiven you? Well, there won't be any of us going to heaven. The Bible teaches, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. And Matthew 6, 14 and 15, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we bring all this down, and while there's much left out of it, we covered an area of speech that a lot of times we don't think about it being wrong. And we didn't talk about some that is, as I mentioned in the beginning. But brethren, the tongue's a wonderful instrument from God. And with it, we can do great good or great evil. And understanding the ever-present dangers with regard to the tongue, we must be ever so careful lest we engage in the wrong kind of speech. So may God help us always to guard our hearts and our tongues. 
and apply this to it, though we usually apply it from the standpoint of speaking the truth of God's word in preaching and teaching the gospel. But you see, it also applies here. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4.11. See, that covers not only being sure you preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's gospel, but it also means all these areas we've studied today because that's the way the oracles of God say we ought to speak. If you're not a child of God today, in the beginning you'll remember that we studied what to do to become a Christian. As a child of God, if you've sinned, we've studied what you need to do to gain forgiveness of those sins. We trust that your heart is such that you're willing to comply with the Lord's will for He's the only Savior we have and that He will forgive us. And He wants to forgive us. It's up to us to comply with His mandates and principles given to us by His great love and grace that we might enjoy the things that God have all men enjoy. So if you're subject to the great invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.